I'm talking here with uh, Louise Bernice Haaf, who's also known as a uh, sky dancer. And, and uh, Louise was born in Two Hills, Alberta, uh, and attended uh, Blue Quills Residential School. Uh, her first book of poetry, Bare Bones and Feathers, won the Milton Acorn People's Poet Award. And she was a finalist for the Spirit of Saskatchewan Award, the Pat Wather Award, and the Gerald Lampert Award. Uh, Blue Marrow was nominated for the Governor General's Award in 1998, and she's also served as uh, Saskatchewan's Poet Laureate. Her most recent book is called The, the Crooked Good. Uh, welcome, and it's a pleasure to uh, get a chance to talk with you. Hi, hi. Uh, I saw on your bio it says uh, Blue Quills Residential School. Was that part of that terrible uh, residential school thing? That Oh, yes, uh, yes. I, I, I think I was still part of the scoop then because Indian Affairs arrived at our doorstep in the middle of the night. Uh, I remember it was really, really dark and it was my niece and myself and I think my, um, my brothers and, and my sister had already gone ahead but at the time I didn't know where they went, they just disappeared. And then it, I was about six or seven when they came and um, that's how it happened. They just came and took you? Yeah, they just came and took us. Oh my God. Yeah. yeah. How, how, how did you survive that? Uh, well, essentially what happened was it destroyed my family. Um, uh, I have my older sister is thir thir 13 years older and my, my brother is um, 7 years older and then my late brother would have been a couple of years older. He took his own life when he was 26 and uh, my family became quite fragmented uh, after that because it just became fragmented. It didn't know how to be family. Just didn't know how to be family. Well, if you cut parts out of it, you can expect it to yeah. function. Well, mm -hmm. how I equate it yeah. is that um, it, people talk about child abduction and propaganda, and essentially that's what it is. Except usually it's a, a parent that abducts their own children, right? But with us, it's it's a total system that's totally foreign to us. Yeah. How did, how did you manage to hold on to your own culture while, while going through that, or did you manage? Or? No, uh, actually, I kept the language, but um, um, culturally speaking, I think there's a part of us that went to sleep until our, my late 20s, and there was a, a band of Indians that went, left the Hobima Reserve in Alberta, the, the small boys band, band in a Mackinac camp, and it was through their leaving and retreating into the mountains and living in teepees and tents that kind of renewed, I suppose, and revitalized what had been damaged. And um, I ended up up there. And, and, and that's where it began uh, my, my journey of uh, reclaiming and resurrecting what had gone to sleep. Because when I, when I was home as a little girl, I had watched my grandmother in her lodge, in her sweat lodge, and, and doing her medicines and whatnot. Bare Bones and Feathers writes about that. And um, uh, we used to have our own sweat lodge when I was growing up. And of course, I grew up quite traditionally, and that's always stayed with me because we'd go home during the summer months. But um, it was tough going, you know, because what they, what they did was teach cultural shame, um, internalized self-hatred, uh, systemic racism, so we, uh, there was a lot of uncovering of that, and, and yeah. How, how old were you when you sort of moved up into the hills then? There, into the what? You in, said, you into said, the mountains? Yeah. Um, I was uh, 20, yeah. And were you writing then? Was that something that you'd been doing? or? I started writing when I was 16. Um, like most people, you know how I write a letter about I'm going to commit suicide, come to my funeral and feel sorry for me, <laughs> teenage angst. Um, but I had a friend who was quite, um, who loved the poetry and saw the potential in it. And I wrote till I was about 18 and she kept all of that material. I don't know what's happened to it since. Um, but I was forced to retreat from the writing because it wasn't safe to do it at home. And uh, I didn't start writing again till probably till I was about 28. And then, and then I didn't really know that I was writing because I was just keeping a journal. When you say it wasn't safe, what would happen if you if you wrote at home? Um, well, my father would get into into it, and then it wasn't private material, right? Because it's teenage angst; you're working through stuff, and uh, um, it's in, in that respect. I mean, and any any writer, I think, has to feel safe and 
feel that they have to trust the people around them not to look in their journals, you know, and be respectful and mindful of that. Well, how do you survive as a writer? Right. Well, first, my, um, my background is in social work, and I have training in addiction facilitation, and I'm a facilitator, so I do, I combine that work with my work uh, as a writer, bringing workshops together. But I'm very fortunate to have a partner who looks after me. I'm one of those lucky people. Um, I don't have to worry about where my bread's coming from. So, um, yeah, not, not, not a, lot, a lot of writers have that. So now, when, when, you, when a poem, uh, how do poems come to you? What, how, what is it that starts you on a poem or gets you working on one? Um, I call it regurgitating and vomiting on paper first. <laughs> <laughs> And then just stirring it around and seeing the outcome. It's like throwing a slop bail on paper and watching the compost, right? And uh, it, it's just, it's actually for me, it's just straight journaling and then it works itself out. It germinates from that material and I sift through it. And um, that's how it comes. But I also do a lot of research. If I'm interested in a topic area, I research it in the archives and through people and through other people's work. and. Uh, um, then I go for it. But, but sometimes it's just a germination of a seed, like for this book, for The Crooked Good, for example, um, has been in my memory since I was a child because both my parents were oral traditionalists and um, they told me this story about um, a woman who had lovers as, as snakes and uh, whose husband was jealous of the, uh, the, the snake, so he kills them and decapitates her. And it's, it's based on a creation myth. And um, uh, she has two sons. And one of the, the sons is Wisagetza, who is a Cree trickster f mystical figure. And, um, but th that story is in here. And, it, and I wove it into the psychology, psychology of three generations of women. Mm -hmm. yeah. I see my writing as sort of like uh, the oral tradition coming on paper. And it's an act of preservation. It's we have to pass these stories on. They have to be heard. They mm -hmm. have to be heard because um, when I'm writing, I'm actually walking and pacing. Once I get the poem, I'm walking and pacing and listening to the breath and to the dance of the language. And if it doesn't fit and I stumble along ago, that doesn't work. It's, you know, but erase that off. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, as a young writer, I suppose, first the issue of safety, right? They have to feel safe in their own environment. And, um, um, Keeping a journal uh, uh, every day is a really good idea because every day is a story and there's always new things happening. Um, keeping the thesaurus and dictionary is a Bible. Read everything you can get your hands on. Like I, like I said, I didn't come from a um, writing tradition, like, so I, ha I had to read everything from Archie Comics to, you know, the th trashy kind of stuff to, till I got mm -hmm. a little bit more advanced in my education. Um, Read, 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 read. Like I pick things up through osmosis and I listen and steal. So if I hear something musical in our exchange, I will write that down. Like for example, I, there was a, a person in my writing group who sat there and she said, I don't want anybody to know, I don't want anybody to know me. You know, and, and she's writing, right? And I love that image of her sitting there with her ears closing. I don't want anybody to know me and I'm going, but writing is going to expose you. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing here? Yeah, yeah. But not, you know, not that yeah. it's mm -hmm. necessarily her eventually, but mm -hmm. it's such a great line, I don't want anybody to know me, that I started thinking, I could do something with that. Was your, your first language wasn't English then? Maybe? No, it's Cree. Uh, okay. And do you ever write in Cree? Or? I mix the Cree in with the, the English. Yeah. yeah. Because yeah. I can hear the sound of another language down yeah. at the bottom of that poem. Yeah, Atayukan. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, what's Gisigam or Ghanim and Sigason? Loosely translated is the, my name is Sky Dancer. Ah. But it actually doesn't mean that. Okay. It's, it's greater than that. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah.